Good evening. I'm Ken Danchik, Subdean of the Pittsburgh AGO Chapter, and on behalf of our Dean Chaz Bowers and our Chapter Officers, welcome to this virtual program on the history of the Carnegie Music Hall Skinner Organ. The fascinating story of this organ will be explored in a presentation by Chapter member Jim Stark, followed by an online discussion with Jim, Ed Halo, Henry Prowitz, and Lewinsky and Frank Kurtick. Follow the on-screen directions to submit your questions during the discussion. This program is one of several programs celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of our wonderful Pittsburgh chapter and the members who have shaped it into one of the most active and important chapters in our guild. Stay tuned for a fabulous presentation. Good evening and welcome. It would have been great to be able to meet in the music hall, but these are hard times. That being said, let me begin our virtual discussion of the sleeping giant that is the 126 rank Skinner pipe organ in the music hall. It has long been my fondest wish that this instrument could be restored and preserved, but unfortunately, wishes don't always come true. In the October Pipelines, we laid out a brief history of the organs in the music hall, and I would now like to expand on that and put some faces to those who built and played these organs, as well as to have a chance to hear what the organ might have sounded like when it was in its prime, and then to update some of the history. First, let me talk about the man who made it all possible. Andrew Carnegie grew up poor and was largely self-educated. He developed a love for books and libraries. Although not a musician, he also developed a love for the pipe organ, which he thought ennobling his word. During his lifetime, he made grants for almost 8,000 pipe organs and some 2,500 library buildings. His first two libraries were in his hometown of Allegheny, now Pittsburgh's north side, and in Braddock near his first steel mill. Six of his library buildings contained concert halls, all in the Pittsburgh area, and five were equipped with pipe organs, Allegheny, Homestead, Braddock, Duquesne, and of course, Oakland. The Carnegie Music Hall in Carnegie seems to be the odd man out. The Carnegie Library, Museum, and Music Hall in Oakland opened in November of 1895. It was designed by the architectural firm of, of Longfellow, Alden, and Harlow. Alexander Wadsworth Longfellow, a cousin of the famous poet, and Frank Alden had worked for H.H. H. Richardson in Boston. After Richardson's death, they decided to set up their own shop and invited Alfred Harlow, who had been with Longfellow at MIT, to join them. Harlow had been working for Stanford White at McKim, McKim, Mead and White in New York. Longfellow, the chief designer, had studied in Paris after MIT, and his inspiration appears to have been the Trocadero Palace, which was a 4,600-seat concert hall built for the 1878 Paris Exposition. The interiors also show some similarities. The organ in the Trocadero was built by Aristide Caviar Cole and may have inspired much of the secular organ music that came out of France during the late 19th century, including the symphonies of Vierne and Vidor. In 1907, the building was substantially enlarged now under the direction of Alden and Harlow, the partnership having broken up with Longfellow remaining in Boston and Alden and Harlow continuing in Pittsburgh. Harlow was probably the chief designer. The first organ in the hall was built by Ferrand and Vody. William Ferrand and Edwin Vody had formed a partnership to manufacture reed organs, 
But in 1889, they purchased the Granville Wood Pipe Organ Company in Detroit. And then, in 1892, they acquired the Roosevelt Organ Works in New York. Hilborn Roosevelt, the founder of the firm, was an admirer of Cavalier Cole, and this organ would have been on the cutting edge of romantic organ building in the United States at that time. Here we see Frederick Archer, the first organist and music director, standing next to the original Farron and Vody console. Archer was an English composer and conductor who had come to Pittsburgh after holding positions in New York, Boston, and Chicago. The organ was a 57 stop, 61 rank, four manual electro-pneumatic. Note the flat pedal board. With the opening of the Music Hall, the Art Society of Pittsburgh saw a chance to establish a professional symphony orchestra. They asked their members to pledge $25,000, about $700,000 today, for three consecutive years. H.C. Frick, George Westinghouse, and Robert Pitcairn, a founder of PPG, were among the contributors. Some evidence suggests that Westinghouse may have been the instigator. In 1898, Victor Herbert, then principal cellist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra in New York, was appointed to replace Archer as conductor of the Pittsburgh Orchestra. Archer remained as the music hall organist. Here is the Pittsburgh Orchestra on the music hall stage in 1904. If you could look closely, you would see that this was an all-male ensemble, including the harpist. You may also notice that they are seated the same as the current Pittsburgh Symphony. The so-called American seating plan devised by Stokowski in Philadelphia had not yet come into vogue, although many American orchestras still use that plan. The gentleman on the podium in this photo is not Herbert, but rather Richard Strauss, who was touring America at that time and shared the conducting duties with Herbert for this concert. Herbert can be seen in the back row playing the bass fiddle. Archer passed away in 1901, and almost immediately, Edwin Lemaire was appointed. Lemaire was another Englishman who we all remember for his orchestral transcriptions, some of which, I'm told, are treacherous. Try his ride of the Valkyrie. This is a Will cigarette card, a forerunner of the highly collectible baseball cards, and an indication of how popular organists were at the time. My thanks to Roland Smith for this wonderful piece of ephemera. In 1903, Lemaire brought back Edwin Vody, then in partnership with George Hutchings in Boston, to make a couple of tonal changes and install a new console presumably with a concave pedal board. Console technology was rapidly changing. Lemaire left Pittsburgh in 1905, and after a two-year search, Charles Heinroth, a popular New York organist, was appointed. Heinroth is also remembered as the first dean of our AGO chapter here in Pittsburgh when it was formed in 1921.
Charlie was also not shy about expressing his opinion, as can be seen in this New York Times interview following his appointment. In 1910, Heinroth brought in Ernest M. Skinner, a rising star in the organ world, to make a few adjustments, some of which seem a bit radical. Skinner added a new first open diapason and an eight-foot tromba, both on 10 inches wind pressure. He then replaced the third open diapason the four-foot octave, the mixture, and the eight-foot trumpet with tibia, gross flute, gamba, and erzähler, which was a Skinner invention, all at eight-foot. Similar changes were made in the swell, replacing the four-foot octave and the mixture with eight-foot ranks. All in all, 15 ranks were either new or revoiced, and he added a new console which was placed on an elevator so it could be raised to stage level. One can only speculate, but Heinroth may have wanted the, the increase in eight-foot sound to better handle orchestral transcriptions, which had become the mainstay of municipal organ recitals, since so few cities had symphony orchestras. While Pittsburgh had an orchestra, it was on its last legs and actually did not survive 1910. For the next 16 years, until the current Pittsburgh Symphony was formed in 1926. If you wanted to hear classical music in Pittsburgh, you went to the Oakland or Northside music halls on Sunday afternoon. The organ had now increased to 65 stops and 62 ranks with harp and celesta. In 1917, Skinner returned to build a completely new instrument. While he retained some of the Ferrand and Vody pipes, they were substantially revoiced since they were on new wind chests and the pressure had been raised to five to six inches from the original three and a half. This was now a Skinner organ. The organ had now grown to 106 stops and 108 ranks with harp, celesta, chimes, and a grand piano, which was located in the stage right proscenium box and playable from the keyboard. While Skinner was well on his way to becoming the premier organ builder of the first third of the 20th century, he was never a very good businessman. In the late teens, his firm was struggling financially, and he brought in an outside investor in the person of Arthur Hudson Marks, an organ devotee who had made a fortune in the tire and rubber business. Here we see Marks and Skinner at the console of the 1919 Skinner organ in Marks' home in Yorktown Heights, New York. Essentially, Marx had bought a controlling interest in the Skinner Organ Company, and Skinner continued as manager and tonal director. As the 1920s rolled on, Marx sensed that the market was changing and thought the firm needed new blood. He convinced Skinner to hire G. Donald Harrison from the Henry Willis Organ Company in London. Skinner had had a long and cordial relationship with the Willis firm, so initially he and Harrison got along. But as time went on, the two began to clash, and to add insult to injury, the potential clients were leaning more toward Harrison's ideas. Things got so out of hand that in 1930, Marx forced Skinner to sign a five-year contract and decreed that whomever brought in the organ contract would see it completely through the shop without interference from the other. In 1931, Harrison brought in two large Pittsburgh contracts, Sacred Heart, which was never fully completed, and, and East Liberty Presbyterian Church completed in 1935. In the early 1930s, Heinroth decided to return to New York 
and Marshall Bidwell, then at Coe College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, was appointed. Here he is shown at the 1929 Skinner Organ in War Memorial Auditorium in Cedar Rapids. He appears to have been a Skinner fan. In 1933, Bidwell brought Skinner back to rebuild the organ and, as far as we can tell, the contract was entirely under Skinner's direction. While he added only a total of 18 ranks, 38 ranks were either new or revoiced. It was also probably Skinner's last major project at what was then Aeolian Skinner since as related to me by Donald Gillette, the last president of Aeolian Skinner, in late 1933, Marx told Skinner that he would continue to pay his salary as long as Skinner stayed out of Boston, which he did. He had already set up a new company in his son's name, and after his contract lapsed in 1936, he joined his son and they built organs together until Skinner retired in 1949 but he never achieved his former prominence. The organ was now 110 stops, 126 ranks with harp, celesta, chimes, piano, and one additional percussion. In 1930, the H. J. Hines Company built an auditorium connected to their offices and factory on the north side primarily for trade shows. The Wurlitzer Company installed a 1925 Skinner Theater organ that had been taken out of the Metropolitan Theater in Boston, now the Wang Center for the Performing Arts. By 1950, it was no longer needed, so the pipework was dispersed and the percussions were donated to the Carnegie. Aeolian Skinner, which was then under the leadership of G. Donald Harrison, was contracted to do the work. The organ remained at 110 stops and 126 ranks, but with the addition of nine more percussions, it probably has the largest toy counter of any concert hall organ in the country. While he was at it, Harrison replaced the swell mixture and also replaced or revoiced the 16, 8, and 4-foot swell chorus reeds. But the organ remains 90-plus percent the work of E.M. Skinner, and having heard a number of Skinner organs over the years, I think it may have been his best. At the end of this program, I would like you to hear a recording that was made during the first, and unfortunately last, Pittsburgh Contemporary Music Festival in 1953. This was the brainchild of William Steinberg, who had taken over the leadership of the symphony the year before. It was a week-long event that involved almost every musical organization in the city. Almost 4,800 regularly scheduled free Sunday afternoon and in the early years, Thursday evening recitals were played in the musical. The last in early 1981, and after that, the organ was left to deteriorate. On the right is the 1933 console as it appeared when it was brand new. On the left is the same console photographed in 2010 which, which clearly shows the wear and tear and the neglect, which unfortunately is pervasive throughout the organ. Even the Skinner bench had gone missing. However, the console and the organ itself are restorable. And as an example, here are two Skinner consoles of the period, which were restored by Joe Zamberlin and Dick Houghton back in 2008. Anything is possible, it just takes money. In 1990, the trustees of the Carnegie did seriously consider restoration of the organ, even going so far as to request a proposal from Nelson Barden, one of the top re restorers. 
But nothing came of it. We still need an organ donor. For the Organ Historical Society Convention in 2010, we were able to raise the organ console to stage level and turn it on. At OHS conventions, it has, long, it has been a long-standing tradition to sing a hymn with each organ we visit. While the organ was virtually unplayable, Jared Daniels was able to squeeze enough out of it for us to sing a hymn. At the end of this program, we will bring you a YouTube clip with 370 OHS members lustily singing a hymn. If you have had any association with the Navy, this may bring a tear to your eye.
Thank you for listening. I have enjoyed being with you.